بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm going to let Shayar introduce himself, and then we're going to dive in and talk about how to get into the best college today. All right, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So we are going to dive in just real briefly. Uh, as Sadia mentioned, uh, we are both the co-founders of the success company. My name is Shayar. I we started this organization about five years ago. Um, before that, both of us graduated from UC Berkeley, and before that, both of us uh, had to kind of figure out the whole college admissions process, and it was a, a bit difficult because we were the first in our family, or not the first, but uh, she was the first, I was the second. Our parents had not really gone through this process much before, um, and similar to a lot of parents uh, and a lot of those who came from other countries, it's a little bit difficult to understand what's the SAT, what's the ACT, what are all these subject tests, what are college applications, what are college essays. And so we went to different mentors to kind of navigate the process. Eventually after graduating, we said, hey, we want to figure out a way to kind of give back to the community. We started doing uh, workshops in our local communities and then it eventually led to our organization, Alhamdulillah. So today we're going to be talking about um, a couple of different aspects of the college process. I just wanted to see a quick show of hands for both parents and students. So who is either a student or a parent of a freshman? So, okay. And then sophomores. Got it. And juniors. Okay. And seniors. One more time for seniors. How many? Okay. And then any community college students? Got it. Okay. So we actually feel like it's a pretty good split. And then there's um, uh, not as many seniors. So we will be talking about the process from the time you enter high school all the way to the time that you end. We'll actually probably spend more time in the first three years, given that there are more people here in the first three years. We'll still dive into the actual specifics of college essays and how to actually write successful college essays. So we'll go ahead and dive in uh, with the first uh, section, which is the college application process. So college is not just something you start thinking about when you are a senior uh, or even a junior. It's actually something that's very important for families and for parents and for students to start thinking about early on. Because what you do in high school has a huge impact on the type of college that you're going to go to. And so you have to really make sure that you have a plan and a strategy that is set for every single year of the high school process. So the, the first step is... No? Better? I'll just go like this. Uh, so the first step is really all about strategy. So it's important when you're in late middle school, and especially by the time you get into freshman year, that you start looking at schools, you start thinking about the type of colleges that you would want to go to. It's also important to take a step back and not just go on you know, Google and search best colleges in America and then make that your list. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to just go on the US News list and then um, make that your list. You want to actually think about what cultures, what values, what aspects of a college are the most important to you, and then you base your list on that. There's no set rule that the best college in the world for you is Harvard. It might be the high, most highly ranked college, but it could actually be the worst college for a very specific student. Uh, the success of an individual in life it is somewhat determined by the college that they go to, but mostly it's determined by the hardworking nature of that person. And so that's really, really important, again, especially when uh, we live in a society where rankings are so, 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 uh, so much of a focus for a lot of students to not just base your list off of rankings, but to really start thinking early on, what do I want to get out of college? Then start having conversations with people, right? So you might know somebody who went to, you know, Santa Clara University or San Jose State University or UCLA or Stanford or Arizona State University or a variety of different universities. Start actually asking them, hey, what was your experience like? What's good about the school? What's not so good? What should I keep in mind? Do that research. That's actually really important. Go on their website. Read the uh, descriptions. Go watch videos, YouTube videos about student testimonials and what faculty are saying. And that will start to help you, and especially parents. Um, it will help inform you and students about what types of universities are going to be beneficial when you actually go to apply. Also, it's important to understand um, that you don't have to decide your major by ninth grade. Not at all or 10th grade, or 11th grade, or even 12th grade. A lot of people come in and they think in high school they have to have it all figured out. And by the time they graduate high school, if they don't know if they want to be a doctor or an engineer, which are the two things every everybody in our community seems to want to do, 
um, then things are things are not going to go well for them. That's not the case. You can pick your major when you actually get into college, but you should have an understanding of what different types of majors are out there, what different types of tracks are out there. So, for example, a lot of people say, I want to do pre-law or pre-med. There's no major that you would select that says pre-med. That doesn't exist. There's no major that says pre-law. You would just major in whatever you wanted. For medical school, you have certain requirements, primarily science classes. For law school, you have certain requirements. And you just have to make sure those are completed. Once you complete those, you take the you know, tests, uh, MCAT, LSAT, these different types of tests, and then you go ahead and apply. But it's very, very important to just have a sense of that going in so you're not confused because you don't want to go to a college thinking that there's going to be some major that's going to kind of set you up perfectly for medical school. That, that doesn't exist. You can major in English and still go to medical school, and you can major in biology and go to law school. There, there's not necessarily um, a focus there. And the other thing is visiting campuses. So it, it is important if you can make time. We always suggest like combine it with a vacation or something, but go visit different campuses. So if you're going to LA already, you know, go to Irvine, go to UCLA, go to UC Riverside, go to you know, some uh, CSU state schools down there. Go and visit, and that'll help. Same thing with the Bay Area. There's so many schools there. Santa Clara, Stanford, UC Berkeley. Uh, there's a bunch of schools in San Francisco. There are uh, schools all over kind of other parts of the Bay Area. There's schools locally here. So it's just important to visit and so you actually get a feel because it's college is about a lot more than what you read on the news and what you read in rankings. It's, it's important to visit, see what it's like. If you can go sit in a class, if you can visit on a weekday and go sit in a class um, and they have no problem with students doing that, just going and sitting in a lecture and learning a little bit and understanding what's going on, that would also be helpful. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the strategy and the planning process is take a Take a step back, and we're not going to talk about this that much in the presentation, but we're more than happy to discuss it later at some point. Take a step back, and as students especially, think about what you want to do and what you actually enjoy. Don't just do something. Like I was talking to a student yesterday, actually, and he was literally like talking to me about majors based on, based on jobs and then based on research he had done about salaries and based on research he had done about how many hours you would have to work at that job when you actually get the job. And he's like in 10th or 11th grade, I was like, dude, you're thinking way too far. That's like, don't worry about all that stuff right now. Like which job it has the most pay. Don't worry about any of that. Just figure out what you actually enjoy doing. And there should be some viable career track with that. But that's it. Because the way things are changing, you have no idea what the landscape is going to look like in, in, in the job landscape in 10, 15 years by the time somebody's actually done. And secondly, don't just base things off of, oh, you know, doctor makes the most money. So I should be a doctor. That that's very uh, uh, that's not solid reasoning, right? You want to make sure you're doing something you actually enjoy because getting through medical school is. I'm not, I don't know if there's any doctors in the room, but uh, you could tell tell us better than I could. Getting through medical school is is difficult. So you don't just want to do something because of the money. And then parents, it's also important to remember that, alhamdulillah, where we live, especially in the Bay Area, there are a lot of different opportunities. Don't just pigeonhole your child and for, force them to do anything. This happens a lot in our communities. Parents literally give them three options, doctor, engineer, lawyer. And most of the time, it's doctor. Then second is engineer. And then they say, oh, you do computer science, do this. And, and that's it. And you, you give your child no room for creativity, no room for thinking. And then they end up doing something because they don't want to displease you. They don't like it. Most of the time, they struggle with it and they get bad grades. Then you get mad at them, oh, why are they getting bad grades? And this cycle continues and continues. I see this all the time. I've been seeing this for 20 years easily. And it continues and continues. So just keep that in mind that, like, you know, have a conversation. What do you enjoy doing? Give advice and then let your student and the students for you come up with what you actually like yourself. And then it should be an ongoing conversation as you take classes and you learn more about it. So once you've done that, then you start planning for different components. There are three to four components of high school. You have your grades, you have your SATs, uh, you have your extracurriculars, then you have the actual college apps. And internships are captured within extracurriculars. So the first thing to do is, again, you lay out what kind of colleges maybe you'd want to go to. From there, you actually start to plan out for your standardized tests. This is now starting to happen, uh, starting to happen earlier and earlier. A lot of students um, sometimes wait till junior year, um, sometimes late sophomore year to start thinking about SAT. Highly recommend you start thinking about SAT like, as soon as you get into high school, if not like late eighth grade. Start thinking about SATs and standardized tests. And it's OK if you haven't done that. Don't worry. But this is just something to keep in mind, whether it's for you or for, you know, for your siblings, uh, the younger siblings, to just remind them, right? In ninth grade, you want to take um, 
uh, practice tests for the for the PSAT, the practice for the practice. So the PSAT is the practice SAT. Um, if you do really well in it, you can get certain scholarships and whatnot. Don't focus too much energy on this one. Focus on the real one, SAT or the real SAT or the real ACT. But by ninth grade, you should buy a book for the SAT. Start doing prep regularly. The one the amount I would recommend is about three hours a week. Three hours a week, very doable for most people. Do one or two hours in the weekdays, one or two hours in the weekends. Three hours a week, and you do that every single week throughout your ninth grade, and you'll be in a good place. Just go online, Amazon, buy a Kaplan SAT prep book, and you can start to do the prep. By 10th grade, you can either enroll in a prep course, which are really expensive, and we don't, I don't recommend prep courses. We don't recommend prep courses uh, unless if, if, if uh, you are somebody who's self-disciplined. The way reason prep courses help is because these are like Elite and uh, Kaplan, Princeton Review, um, what are some other ones? C2, there's all these other ones. Sometimes they cost anywhere from $1,000 to like $7,000. So I don't recommend these unless you actually don't have any discipline. They help you get disciplined. They're not teaching you any like amazing secrets that you can't figure out on your own. But they do help you get disciplined because you have homework, you have assignments, you have to go to the class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you'll see a lot of people taking those in, in, in our communities. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if you can do it on your own, um, you'll definitely be able to save some money there. Uh, do, by 10th grade, you should be doing one practice test per week. So the SAT is a four-hour test. The ACT is also a four-hour test. I would just block off time on a Saturday or a Sunday um, and do one practice test a week. And you'll be able to, again, get in a good rhythm. If you're already in 10th or 11th grade and you're not doing that, start doing that. The year just started. You can definitely get, get, get into a good rhythm there. 11th grade, I, we would recommend taking the test sometime in 11th grade, ideally in the beginning of the year, like the official exam. Register for the exam and then going and taking the exam in 11th grade, either in, in early 11th grade or late 11th grade. Um, and then 12th grade, you also would have time that you can retake, you can retake the SAT and the ACT as many times as you want. Um, ideally, you don't do it more than two or three times, but um, if you need to, you can. And the summers are very, very important. Summers for high schoolers are not vacations. They're, they're staycations. You work. You stay home and you work where you take a vacation for a little bit, but like it's really important to be doing SAT, to be doing a job of some sort, to be working on your study habits, to be working on your sleep habits, to be working on yourself generally so that you can be in a good rhythm when you get to school. And obviously relaxing and having fun is important um, as well. But you'll have lots of fun when you're in uh, college, inshallah. All right, step three, extracurriculars and leadership. Also important to plan out early on. I won't walk through all of these, but these are some different examples of what you should be considering when you do extracurriculars. A lot of times we have students or parents come up to us and they ask, like, oh, what's the best kind of extracurricular that I can do? Like, um, for example, like, should I get my child into this sport or should I get do this and do that? And then it has no consideration for what this child is actually good at or what their passions or interests are. The answer to that question is the best sport or extracurricular or club that you can do is something that you actually enjoy. So if you enjoy skateboarding, it should be something related to skateboarding. If you enjoy um, writing, it can be something related to writing. If you enjoy... Uh, computers, it can be something in relation to that. Whatever you, if you enjoy art, it should be something related to that, right? And then get deep. The most important thing I'll say, if, we'll say for extracurriculars, is get deep in a few areas you really enjoy instead of joining like ten clubs and not really going deep in each. You want to ideally pick a few clubs at the beginning of your high school year career, and then go be a member, and then go apply for officer, and then you want to be like a VP, and then by senior year you're president of like a few different clubs. And that's sufficient. You don't want to go all over the place and just be a member in a bunch. Second thing for extracurriculars, you want to do something in your community, right? So some people might come to the masjid, volunteering, things like that. But again, you want to pick a few things and do it really well. So if you're going to do the masjid, be like there for all three, four years and really build an impressive um, experience if you're volunteering at the masjid. Don't just volunteer, okay, there's a creek cleanup here. And there's, I mean, these are all good things to do just for your, for your you know, own self and for, for the sake of Allah. But from a very specific college application point of view, it's not beneficial to just go and do a creek cleanup, a road cleanup, trash cleanup here. And they're too disparate. There's no story. There's no theme. They should all have a theme. They should be connected. And then finally, what colleges are looking for is they're looking for growth, leadership, and some type of um, uh, journey. They don't just want you to show, oh, I started this, and then that was it. If you started something, what was the path to get there? Why did you decide to found, found, found this club? Why did you decide to found this organization? What about it was interesting to you? What has been your path since then? What have you grown 
what have you improved upon, et cetera. So just keep that in mind. All right, so that was extracurriculars and leadership. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the actual specific um, college application process. So uh, the application process, this is now, it starts your senior year. So right now we're in the thick of it. September, if you're a senior, you probably already know this. Um, if you're anywhere else in high school, you probably see your friends that are seniors going through the rigor of college applications. The application process it generally opens up like late July, early August. They're due, apps are due, UC apps are due at the end of November, um, and most private school apps are due anytime between November and January, most being due on January 1st. So those, these are the months. Now you don't just want to start working on them in October, you want to start a long time before then, right? What is, the, what is the point of the college application? It's the opportunity for you to really highlight your unique achievements, really talk about your leadership experiences, really discuss how you've grown. And as we mentioned, the colleges will evaluate you based on these four or five criteria, right? Grades, academics, standardized tests, extracurriculars, and your essays. A lot of people, you'll spend, you know, four years on your grades, at least a year or two prepping for your standardized tests, a bunch of time extracurricular activities. And then when it comes to the essays, people will spend like a couple weeks, maybe sometimes a couple months. You want to spend a lot of time on your essays. They're really important. This is your time to actually show that you're more than a number. You're more than just a resume. You are actually a person who has experiences, who has a certain story that they can tell. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind for the, the application process. Did you want to add anything there? All right. So we're going to now talk about specifics about each uh, application. So the UC application, as we mentioned, is due November 30th. Uh, SAT, ACT, one of the two is required. Um, does anybody, uh, we can actually, feel free to ask us in, in the question and answer session about SAT, ACT specific questions, but basically SAT is one test, ACT is another test, they're just different governing boards. You can take either one, you don't have to take both, either one to get into college. Um, once you've taken it and you've got a good enough score, don't worry about it after that. There's also something called the SAT subject test, which they're available in you know, math, science, history, um, and a bunch of different other uh, categories. There's, there's lots of different subject tests. Some schools will require it. Most private schools do require it. Uh, UCs, it does sometimes depend on your major. So engineering, computer, technical majors will require specific technical subject tests. So that's just something to keep in mind. This is a, a test that takes one hour. It's out of 800 points. And you can go and buy a book at, or nobody goes anywhere to bookstores. Go on Amazon, and then you can go and um, buy a book for you know SAT subject test in biology and it's really recommended to pair these with AP classes. You take AP biology, you should take the AP you should take the SAT subject test for biology. If you take AP US history, take the SAT subject test for US history. It's all the same material phrased differently and you'll kill two birds um, with one stone. So that's the uh, what's required application simple you're listing out a bunch of things you're filling out your major you're listing out all the things that you've done. This is not the significant part of the process. The most important is the actual essay. Right? So when people refer to college apps, they're not referring to like filling out the actual application. They're referring to the actual writing of the essays. So for UCs, there are eight questions. You pick four of them, and you write four essays that are 350 words each. That's what uh, the UC essay is about. Now these four questions, are they reflect a lot of different um, types of experiences you might have had. They ask you about a variety of different things, challenges you've been through, your favorite subject, these types of things. So um, it's important actually early on to just get a look, just just take a look at the questions and say, hey, what would I write about? Even if you're a freshman, what would I write about right now? Okay, I don't have too much to write about. Let me start doing things so I have something to write about. That's important. Common application. This is an application for private schools, uh, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, um, Santa Clara, most of these schools are on the common application. So it's not, and, and it doesn't matter what rank of private school they are, they're generally there. Um, it's very easy, you just have to create an account on Common App, and then uh, this one is a little different. There's not four essays, one essay, it's longer, it's about 650 words. You can pick between seven prompts, and when you write that essay, you're going to submit that essay to all the colleges you're choosing to apply to on the Common Application. So you don't have to go to like Harvard site and create a separate Harvard application. It's just all done in the Common App. And then what you have is what are called supplemental essay questions. These are usually essays between 50 to 250 words. And they'll ask you about, like, for example, Stanford has one that's famous. It's like, write a letter to your future roommate. Interesting essay topic. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of other types of smaller questions and larger ones. But the goal is put a, put a bunch of thought into all of these questions. All right. 
So now Sadia is going to talk about creating your game plan. All right. So this is important regardless of what grade you're in. So this is actually applies whether you are in eighth or ninth grade or whether you're a 12th grader and you're thinking about applying to college this year. So when you think about applying to college, you never want to put all of your eggs in one basket. So what we see a lot of students do is only apply to one school that they would die to go to, right? Like they apply to their dream school and they're like, well, that's really the only option for me. I don't really want to apply anywhere else. That's a bad strategy. When you think about applying to college, you should be applying to a variety of schools. There are so many universities out there that are good at different things, that have different programs that you would really excel in. So do your research early on to figure out what schools would I be interested in going to? And then you create three buckets. So you create, the th those three buckets are reach schools, match schools, and safety schools. So reach schools are schools that you are your dream school, basically. You would just die to get in. Um, you'd love to go. You would definitely say yes if you got into those schools. Um, there are also schools that are generally more challenging to get into. But one thing to keep in mind is that all of these buckets are totally dependent on your personal scores. So a reach school for me might be different than a reach school for Sherry R based on our GPA, based on our SAT scores. So really use the data that you have. And it's OK if you don't have all of your information yet, right? Like a lot of times we talk to seniors and they're like, oh, I still don't have my GPA yet, or I'm retaking my SAT. Just use the more recent information that you have as a ballpark for making these decisions. So those are your reach schools. Sometimes there will be certain schools that are always in the reach school category. So even though UC Berkeley might have an average GPA posted on their website, it's a really challenging school to get into, similar to UCLA or Harvard or Stanford. So a lot of the times we see those schools show up in the reach bucket. Match schools are schools that you are about 80 to like 90% sure that you're going to get into, right? Your GPA matches their average acceptance GPA. Your SAT scores are in line. Maybe they have a larger percentage of people who get accepted into that school. And these are schools that you would actually really enjoy going to as well. So they may not be, you know, the dream school. Maybe they're not as intense to get into, but these are still schools you would like to go to. And same goes for safety schools. So safety schools are schools that you are almost positive that you're going to get into, right? Like your GPA SAT score is very high compared to their average. And again, a lot of the times people will put safety schools, they'll choose safety schools that they aren't that excited about. They'll say, yeah, like, you know, maybe like I'll put UC Merced, but I would never go to Merced. By the way, Merced is an incredible school. If any of you have not been, it's a smaller school. So you sort of get um, a private school feel for a public school price tag. Um, but if you haven't visited and it's something you're considering, I highly recommend it. It's a really great school. Um, but for that example, right, if somebody thinks that way, you should not put, be putting that school as a safety school. You should be choosing a school that you would still be really excited to go to. So you create this category, you create this game plan, so you know now that the odds are in your favor. Whether or not you get into the schools in your top reach school category, you will still get into schools in your game plan. So that's the important piece to, to, to think about, is really spreading out your odds. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, sorry, this is, we don't need this. We're going to talk about what to do when you're writing your essay. And this is actually really important for all of us to think about, whether we are in ninth grade, whether we're in eighth grade, whether we're in 12th grade. This is just good writing. And it's actually something that I notice a lot of the time that students struggle with. Um, unfortunately, we live in an American country, but our English is incredibly weak. So use this time in high school, in middle school, wherever you are, to really try to strengthen these skills. When college admissions officers are reading your personal statements, they're not looking to see a resume. They're not looking to see the highest GPA. They're not looking to see the highest SAT score. Those things matter, yes. But what they're looking to see is, are you somebody that's interesting? Are you somebody that's going to add color to the campus? Are you going to be somebody that will add uh, an interesting flavor in the classroom? And so all of your personal statements or your college essays should reflect your unique character, your unique personality, and, and your writing style should reflect that as well, too. So there are just a couple of, of do's that I, that I recommend you think about as you write these essays. So the first one is be honest. I get asked this question sometimes, um, you know, how do they know that I'm telling the truth? Well, first of all, Allah knows, 
when you're telling the truth. So that's the first thing. The second thing is people do audit sometimes. Like if, if the claims are almost preposterous, college admissions officers will look in to see if you're, if you're telling the truth. So it's always important, like we start with like the first layer, which is always be honest about your experience. The second one is be concise. Be really specific. And there are some ways that you can do this. Um, one thing that I ask all of my personal students to do is prove to me that this sentence has earned its way on the page. So 350 words sounds like not that much. It's really not that much when you start writing. And when I work with students, I tell them that I don't want to see a draft that's over 100 words beyond the word limit. So if you're going to submit a draft to me to review, it has to be less than 450 words. And that's a good exercise for all of you students as well, too, is when you write your first draft, really put thought into it. Really think, is this sentence adding something unique to this page? Is this sentence, you know, showing a part of myself that maybe another sentence hasn't, right? Is this sentence really communicating this idea in the most crisp way possible? One thing we struggle a lot with is being very vague. So this exercise will prevent you from, from getting too vague. The third piece is to show and not to tell. And the best way to do this is to really practice your storytelling skills. So I always recommend that all of your essays start with a story. And there's generally an outline I give students, and that's my 20-40-40 framework. That 20% is that story where you're in the moment, right? So if you guys watch a movie, does the movie start like if you're in an action movie, does it start with like a narrator or usually does it start with like a speeding car or like an explosion or like something, something like really crazy happening that makes you want to continue watching? It starts with the action, right? So think about your essays like that is like I need to start in the middle of the action. So you zoom in in that 20% and then you zoom out into that second 40%. And what you talk about in that body of the essay is what was the problem that you're trying to solve? So giving some context, right? The what and the how. So what was the problem and how were you solving that problem? So that's your body. So you have 20%, which is the show part, the story part. Then you have your 40%, which is the what and the how. And then your last 40% of the essay is what did you learn? What was the why, right, in your essay? What are the reflections? And the interesting thing is that that last 40% is the most important part of your essay. Like, that is really what admissions officers are looking to understand is what have you learned as a result of this experience. And if you cannot articulate that, they don't really care. So it's really, really important to spend that 40% of the essay rounding out, reflecting on like, what is it that I learned from this experience? Um, I always tell people to reach beyond your leadership positions. Don't use a list. Don't say I was the president of this and I was a VP of this and I have like 10,000 volunteer hours. Like, they don't care really go deeper and think about, okay, I was the president of this and I helped, you know, do this many things. Like this was my impact. So don't think about your positions or lists, think about your impact. Lastly, your personal statement should be an, an intellectual biography. So really like how have you changed as a person like I was talking about earlier? Um, what are you interested in? How has it developed your character? And then of course, have a central idea or theme and build around it. So try to prevent your essay from meandering through multiple different you know, ideas or themes. If you have one theme, stick to that theme and go deep in that theme. So if you're reading your sentence, you're doing that activity I said where you go sentence by sentence and ask, does this sentence belong here? You can ask yourself, is this sentence supporting this particular theme or is it just kind of making a random side point that is not important to what I'm trying to communicate here? So remember some of those things in terms of, of thinking about how do you want to approach your personal statement. So this is an example. Um, it's not, so you want to add something? Sure. So one thing that's really important with personal statements is um, it's not just about what your writing skills are when you start writing the personal statement. It's about how you've developed your writing skills over the course of the last five, six years. So if you start your personal statement as a 12th grader, which everybody does, you should start developing your writing skills as like a 7th grader. What do I mean by that? In this day and age, it's very, very common for us to not read anymore, for us to not practice writing anymore. Reading used to be the equivalent of Netflix. That's what reading used to be. I kid you not. Like, I don't know if any parents in this room, but if you used to just like read books for fun. But that was very common even when we were in 
elementary school. You just read for fun. Like there was not anything else you would do for fun. Reading was very common. But because now there's so much technology, we play video games for fun. People read. Or people read like statuses for fun by right? reviewing our social media feeds for fun, etc. There's not as much emphasis actually put on developing that component in your brain, which actually helps you formulate thoughts, which helps you dive deep into your imagination, which helps you actually put things together. And so the reason we mentioned that's important is if you want to actually write a really good college essay, just invest in your reading. And everybody in this room has the ability to do it. The students in this room, mashallah, very, very talented. I've, I know many of you. Right? You're all very, very talented, mashallah. You can totally do it. It doesn't mean a huge change in your life. Just start reading one book a month. Right? Start writing one like short story or one article analysis a week or a month, whatever it is that you can do. But you will see it pay off a lot when you get to senior year. And you actually need to think about, now I have to write about my life. Or journaling. Does anyone in this room journal? Like have a journal or a diary? Or do reflect? I do it. Anybody else? But journaling is a really helpful exercise to get your, uh, figure out how to actually express your feelings and talk about things that you've learned. So journaling, reading, and doing some other types of writing exercises, I would recommend if you could take something away, if you're not a senior already, start doing that, right? A ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader, or if you're even younger than that. And that'll help you actually develop uh, the writing skills to be able to write essays like what Sadia is about to show you. Your example on journaling, I was just about to share. So my, um, my little sister entered her senior year at Cal. She's a public health major, and she's what you guys would call pre-med. Um, she's been journaling since she was about nine years old, every day. She writes in her journal, every day since she was nine. She's 21. And when it came time to apply for college, she pulled down like cardboard boxes upon boxes out of her closet. I think she had like four boxes. And I was like, what are these? And she's like, oh, these are my journals from when I was, in, when I was nine years old. And she went through her journals to say, to look at different parts of her life of, you know, how did I change when I was 13? How did I change when this experience happened? Like, you know, what were my thoughts when, you know, my grandmother passed away? Like, how was I dealing with that? And she used the themes that she saw in her own personal growth to write her college application essays. And that's really powerful because you're really not making it up, right? Like you have a source and you've really tracked how you've changed. And so it doesn't need to be like a dear diary writing for 30 minutes. Like if you know, even if you spend five minutes in the morning just jotting down your ideas, this is really going to be helpful for your own creativity. Before we move on to this example, which I want you guys to sort of tell me how we can make better in a second, I want to ask the students, how many of you have a cell phone? Oh my god, the hands are like kind of, come on, raise them high. Okay, so okay, so most of us. All right, how many of you guys have some form of social media? It could be Instagram, it could be Snapchat, it could be Facebook, it could be whatever, YouTube. Okay, how many of you guys listen to music? Okay, cool. How many of you guys like listen to podcasts sometimes? All right, what about TV? Like, do you guys watch Hulu, Netflix, like HBO, any of that? Totally normal things, right? These are, part, these are things that are part of our lives, right? Not trying, to be, not trying to shame you guys. When you think, and this is actually an experience I've been going through for the past few weeks, how much of what's up here in my head are my own thoughts or my own ideas, my own creativity, and how much of what's in my head is what somebody else is telling me to think and feel? And how much space does that leave me to be creative and to produce content? I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. How much room does that leave me to be creative when there's constant input in my eyes, in my ears? And it doesn't even have to be bad. Like in the mornings, I listen to a podcast. Sometimes I listen to like the Kalam Institute podcast. Like I love that. Even that, it's wonderful. It's great. But if I'm constantly consuming something, if I'm constantly stimulated, there's no time for stillness in my mind, there is zero opportunity for me to be creative. There's no way I can produce something. There's no way I can write properly if I'm not giving myself some time to just be bored, to just be quiet, to like give myself some time to breathe. And look, like I'm, I'm a, a bit older than the students here, right? Like I'm in my late 20s. And... You guys have some time to go, but if you don't work on the challenges that I'm talking about right now and cultivating stillness in your life, when you're my age, you're going to be like, oh man, I have so much work to do. I have so much work to do. I have so many friends who are struggling to find creativity and like peace in their life, and they're not that old. 
they're in their 20s, they're in their 30s, and they're struggling. And you can prevent that from happening for your own generation if you cultivate that time for yourself. So just keeping all of those things in mind, I think, is important because speaking to this generation right now is really, really, I think, critical because your generation is being attacked in a way that our generation was not. We were absolutely not dealing with the challenges that you guys do. I really feel for you growing up right now. So think about, like, how can I create stillness and peace in my life and ways for me to be creative so that I'm not dealing with some of these challenges later on in my life. Did you want to add something? Um, actually, I think it'd be a good time right now to just see if there's any questions so far um, in terms of what we've chatted about, and then we can go ahead and respond, and then we'll move on. Just any questions or comments, thoughts? Or just what, or other things that, you, you, that, you, that you've seen so far, what you would like to hear, what you were hoping to hear. Just want to make sure we're addressing everything, especially since this is not all seniors, and we're going to be diving a little bit into essays. I want we want to make sure we're addressing um, the concerns of you know parents and students all the way from whatever age until uh, junior senior year. Yes. Um, great question. The essay is if you were to split it up, it would be anywhere from twenty all the way up to forty percent. It's definitely at least one-fifth of your application is the essay. You have like assigned readers who take time to read it, multiple readers, a committee that reads it. Uh, but sometimes it can be so interesting or good or beneficial that it completely changes the mind of the whole committee. I know, more, like for example, my roommate in college, he had um, a, quite a, uh, like a low SAT score from, from, it was at 2,400 at the time, and he had something closer to the 1700s. Um, and, this was, and he got into UC Berkeley. Um, alhamdulillah, and this average score at the time was like 21, 22, but he wrote amazing essays. His mom was a teacher. He himself was good at writing. He was one of the best kayakers in the nation, and he wrote a whole essay about that experience and a variety of other essays, and so it can be really, really significant. Um, it's always quite important, but it can get to the point where it can completely flip your whole application if you do well. Is everything okay? Oh, that one. Great. This one. Oh. One, one more thing one more thing I would say is a lot of the times they're evaluating applicants who have maybe the exact same scores. So you have the same GPA, same SAT score, then it really comes down to how is this person different, right? And you know, only you can write an essay that you write, right? So that's like, yeah, it's 20 to 40% of your application, depends on you know, what school you're applying to, but when it comes down to the wire, it can be what makes the decision. Great question. So there are some schools, like U Chicago that have stopped asking for the SAT or ACT score. So there are a few. The question is, do all schools requ uh, require the SAT or ACT score? Do all schools look at it? Some schools have stopped because, I'm just going to say it, like a lot of times the SAT or ACT is actually not a measure of your aptitude. Um, and people are starting to realize that. But most schools still require it. So it's still one of those things. It's still kind of a game you have to play. Yeah, I would just, it's a quick Google, right? Like, which schools have stopped accepting the ACT or SAT score? Yeah, but for, for, for now, and the question was, can we, where can we find out which schools don't accept SAT, ACT? For now, I would operate under the assumption that every school almost is going to accept required. It's a it's very small amount, and the ones that do um, are either schools that you might not have heard of or schools that are quite good, but you're going to want to apply, as we mentioned, to reach, match, and safety. So always operate under the assumption that you're going to have to take the test and to start preparing yourself early on to take the test. Yeah, so it really doesn't matter. So the question is, do you have to take both, or should we just take one? Because some people are taking both as a way to stand out on their applications. The, the, yes. So you don't have to take both. Colleges aren't going to give you bonus points if you took both. That's not part of it. They're just going to look at what your highest score was. So if you score better on the ACT, then that's the one you should submit. You could submit both if you want to, but it's not going to make you stand out anymore. And there's a lot of misconceptions like that out there. Um, so really good question. If you, and if you, have, if you have a limited number of hours in the day and a limited number of time, don't devote your resources and your time to having to do both. Um, just do one. I did both 
because I actually was hoping to do better on one. So I took the SAT and I was like, ah, I'm not really like loving my score. I kept practicing, but it was difficult for me to improve in the SAT. Then I started taking ACT and I was like, oh, this test suits me better. I kind of should have like done that earlier on and just figured out which one suits me better. But in that situation, it makes sense. Otherwise, don't just do both um, to, to add on something. You can spend that time doing something else for your application. Other question? Yes. So, so the question was, a lot of people go to community college uh, first, and then they go to college, versus some people go to high school, then they go to college directly. So what's, what's our recommendation? If you know that you're going to apply and you're not going to get in, or you have a low score or low chance of getting in, and maybe it's a better idea to go to community college, strengthen some of the fundamental skills, and then apply, I recommend that. But if you have a student who's very competitive, who has a shot of getting in, they should go through that process of applying directly. There's nothing wrong with transferring. Community colleges are incredible. It, and actually, you're right, it's significantly easier to get into, especially some of the best schools, to a UC in particular, through community college. I would say one thing that the student should keep in mind is that the transfer experience and the four-year experience are very different. So the transfer experience, you get a very short amount of time on that college campus and there are a lot of things that you can't do or you just aren't able to do because of the limited time you have on campus. So for example, if you want to run for office, right? Like it's really hard to develop the network that you have within Stu student government, yeah, not US. Yeah, yeah, student government, right? If you want to run for UC Berkeley's or UCLA's student office, for example, it's really hard to do that. Um, not impossible, but just more challenging. So it really comes down to the experience and the particular student. There are, there are a couple of considerations so where, where uh, we'll generally kind of differentiate between what, what we recommend. One, community college is excellent if financial uh, if finances are a really, really uh, important consideration, right? Because you obviously you save on two years of tuition. Now, there's also a lot of financial aid available out there. So if that's a consideration, you should always keep that in mind. But you do save on two years of tuition, and then you have to pay the other two years at the full-time school. The second situation, as Hadia mentioned, is if you actually have somebody who wasn't able to do well. Um, or third is if you have somebody, you know, you, they prefer to stay close to home and that's like generally what the preference is and then you, you know, make that happen or there's a family situation, the student needs to also work to support the family, those type of situations. Where we don't recommend it is if you kind of get into high school, like, oh, well, this doesn't really even matter. Because community college, you don't need to take the SAT. There's a lot of stuff you don't have to do. So if you just use that as a kind of an excuse to coast through high school, be lazy, not work hard and say, I'm just going to go to community college. That's, you're just letting yourself down at that point, right? Because you could still go to community college and it's fine, but you should only do anything in life when you've put your full utmost effort out there. And then, you know, if there's another option, there's another option. Other questions? Yes. The question is whether people who live in a certain state, like let's say California, have a better chance of getting into other out-of-state schools. Um, there could be a factor of that because uh, certain schools charge out-of-state tuition, right? So sometimes they will apportion a certain amount of out-of-state students to get into the school because the out-of-state tuition is usually two to three times as much as the in-state tuition. Um, but generally, it's not that true because, like for example, let's say you're a UC student. Uh, let's say you're going to apply to the UCs and you're applying from Nevada, they are reserving most of the slots for California students. It's much harder to get in from Nevada than it is from you know, living in Pleasanton. Um, because CSUs, UCs, they're, the whole reason they're created was for, for California students, and then they have other students from outside. But um, sometimes it can be true. It really depends. I'm not sure in terms of like the secret sauce of admissions and what they're looking at. Yeah. I think one thing I would add is like, you know, the confounding factor here could be that just generally UCs are really hard to get into compared to other schools, right? Like UCs is like the most competitive public education system and it's getting more and more competitive every year. So if you compare your chance as a student getting into the UC compared to somewhere in Illinois or Texas, yeah. it, they're obviously higher there, right? Because right. generally the admission rates are right. higher there. UCs so that used, could also yeah. be what's happening. Generally just ranked higher than most other school systems yeah. out there yeah, in the nation. So just in the interest of time, I think we should move forward and then we can save some more time for questions at the very end. I want to make sure we get through the personal statement uh, don'ts. And so knowing what to do is just as important as knowing what not to do. And I spoke to some of these things in the first slide, but the first thing is 
don't just like state what you've done and like let that speak for itself. Like, don't do that. Don't just say, oh yeah, obviously I was like the head of volunteers at Kaiser and like, that's what I did. Awesome. There are so many students who are applying who are also the head of volunteering at their local Kaiser. So please make sure that you differentiate yourself and just know that they're reading thousands and thousands of statements. And so there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of the similar things. And this is the other reason why our answer to parents is always, there's no such thing as like the right extracurricular, the right club, the right number of volunteer hours. Because if we said that to you and we said that to every single student we worked with, we would have a number of cookie cutter students who would have equally minimal chances of getting in. There would be no way to differentiate. So that's one thing to remember is like really try to go deep into why you chose that particular activity, why you chose the particular position or the place to volunteer, et cetera. Second is avoid cliches or expressions. Please underline this, students. Never start your essays with a quote. Never do that. Never ever do that, right? Like, because that is like the best way to have the admissions officer put your essay on the side. It is not creative, it's not interesting, even I don't want to read it. And so please make sure that you avoid any of those cliches or expressions or, or, or being vague. Do not rewrite your resume. Similar to what's at the top, right? Don't just go in a list and say, here are all the things I've done, end of story. Each of your essays should focus on a particular topic, a particular theme, a particular story. And it does not need to be everything you've done, right? So for example, if you were uh, in the student government, right? You don't need to list every single thing you've done as a student government officer. What you do need to do is choose a particular time during your time as secretary or treasurer, or president, whatever it might be, and go deep into that activity. Go deep into that situation. What did you learn from it? What did you come out from it? How did you transform as a result of experiencing that? So again, do not just give us a list of everything you've done. We talked about this earlier. Don't be too general. Don't be abstract. Be really specific in what, you're, what you want to say. Use specific language. I even have a list of bad words, like things that I don't let my students use that we do like a search for in their essays. So things like good, bad, hard, this, that, like difficult, like all of those words are, are not allowed. Um, like I said, don't use quotations. Now, using quotes, if you're, t if you're doing dialogue in your essay, that's totally fine. So if you were trying to say, you know, somebody said this and that made you think something, or somebody said this and then you responded, that's totally fine. What I mean by quotations is, you know, quotes by famous people. Um, don't use any negative comments or excuses. So like, don't write your essay about like, man, like, you know, it was really hard. Like, I just like, like, don't blame people for maybe your, your shortcomings. So that's really important. Uh, to remember if you didn't get a good grade right don't blame that on somebody else don't say oh yeah we moved and like I wish my parents hadn't moved because I miss my friends and my parents are the worst like don't do that like use that example of like you know actually moving was very difficult because it made me very lonely and I had to learn to sit with my loneliness and venture out of my comfort zone and make new friends like that's a much better way of talking about that experience and then again like I said don't add too many irrelevant details because you don't want to distract the reader and you don't have that much space. Um, so again, this is just, I just want to uh, do this for the sake of time. So I actually have a couple of activities I want to do with all of you. Um, if you have a notebook and pen, that's awesome. If you have a computer or a phone, that's great too. Parents, you're welcome to do this as well too. Um, it's just like a good activity and it's a, it's a self-reflection -ref activity. I do this with all of my private clients. We work privately with students on their college applications. We start, even before we start talking about what activities have you done, you know, what, uh, what places have you been to, et cetera, we start with the more fundamental frameworks. So these are called the four frameworks, and they are big defining moments in your life. So what was a time when everything changed for you? It can be at any point in your life. It can be when you were seven, it can be when you were 13, it can be when you're 17, it could have been yesterday. It could be something big, like an illness of a parent or God forbid, you know, the loss of a loved one or a move or the birth of a sibling, or it could be, you know, getting a bad grade on a test and realizing maybe you haven't been working that as hard as you, as you need to be, or uh, maybe a moment where you felt like you were not being true to yourself and how that felt and how you decided that you were going to be sincere moving forward. So anything that changed the way you think about the world. Second is your identity. 
And your identity can be things like your gender, your religion, your nationality, your immigration status, but it can also be things like what you're passionate about. So tennis player, writer, pianist, uh, you know, like comedian, right? It, it can be any of those things. So it's totally up to you on how you want to define that identity. The third framework is your values. So not just honesty, you know, sincerity, trust, but how you learn those values. So if your value is hard work, then you need to tell me the story about why you chose hard work. How did you learn that? So if my value is hard work, I would say, you know, my parents are immigrants. My dad came here when he was 19 or 20, and he really worked to give us the life that I have, and I watched him struggle, and I don't take any of that for granted because I know that I wouldn't want his effort to go to waste, to waste, and that's important for me. So, you know, telling the story behind your value. And then last, what are your goals? And by goals, like, it's fine to say my goal is to go to a good college, get a car, buy a nice house, have a nice career. Those are fine but I actually want you to reach beyond those goals. I want you to think about the big problems in your life that you want to solve. So what are the problems that you, that just like burn you up inside that like keep you up at night, right? So these can be things like prison reform. It can be things like the refugee crisis. It can be things like mass shootings in high schools, right? It can be any of those things. So I want you to take a few minutes. I want everybody to just write down what comes to mind for each of these frameworks, and then I would love for us to share and talk a little bit about them. So maybe we'll spend like three-ish minutes doing that, and then we can do a quick share out. Okay. So uh, the next thing we want to do, and then we're going we're gonna to get to question and answers, but I actually want to just ask you all a question, um, especially for those students who might be you're not a senior yet, what do you think at the stage that you're at right now, what do you think is the most important thing that you can be doing in order to prepare for this whole college applications, the, the, the college application process? What do you think is the most important thing you can be doing? And this is like, again, everybody just tell me what you think. I mean, one or two people. Yeah. Get good grades. Okay, so we heard one, get good grades. That's, that's, that's definitely a good part of it. Yes. Focus on leadership positions for extracurriculars. Good. Others. Yes. That's very good. I like that one. There's grow as yourself if you feel like, let's say, you're shy uh, to how to kind of continue to grow. That's really good, mashallah. It's a very impactful one. A lot, sometimes most people don't think about that. They're so focused on growing the application, they forget to grow as a human being. Anything else comes to mind? Parents, any ideas that you have of what you think? Oh, yes, please. That's very good. That's very good. Identify yourself and then go through this whole journey, right, so that you can really, really figure out not only who you are, but where you were and how you got here. Go for one more. Anybody? Okay, so the one that I didn't hear mentioned, and we've, we've, we've actually done like entire presentations about this, um, but we're not going to get into it in too much detail right now. Uh, is the most important thing that anybody can be doing when you're for your college applications process from the time that you start elementary school all the way to the time that you apply for college is actually learning how to manage your time. Learning how to manage your time is your time is your most precious resource and it's the it's the resource that's most under attack these days. If you had somebody coming into your house every five minutes and trying to steal your money, steal your jewelry, steal your laptop, steal something from you, you would be pretty concerned. You would figure out different security systems. You'd figure out different ways. You'd probably move 
you'd get, you know, you'd figure out different ways. Unfortunately, we live, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, but we live in a time right now where there are lots and lots of different entities that are trying to steal your time. Every single application is trying to steal your time. Every single show is trying to steal your time. There are lots of different organizations, corporations that are trying to steal your time. The reason I mention that is that the most successful human beings in history have been the ones that have been the best at managing their time. They have a goal. They stay focused. They don't get distracted, and they just go towards it. And what is the one of the largest inhibitors to that successful path today is we have a goal or we don't have a goal. And we just we're just to get distracted every two minutes, every three minutes, every five minutes. Now it's getting to the point where it's literally multiple times an hour where we get distracted and we're not able to manage our time. So if you're if you aren't at the college application process yet and you really want to nail how to get good grades, as you mentioned, you want to nail how to work on yourself, how to start finding yourself. If you can learn to manage your time and build that essential habit of just being disciplined, understanding the importance of, and again, we're not going to go into all the details, but the er waking up early, not staying up late, making sure you have a certain amount of time you devote to social media and video games and that's it. You don't devote any more time. Not getting sucked into the addictiveness of binge watching you know, Game of Thrones and all these different things that you could be watching. That, you, you will be successful. Even if you don't go to the school that's at the top of the list, I guarantee you, inshallah, you will be successful because you will have picked up a habit and a skill that is the core skill of the majority of successful people today. So um, just keep that in mind. Learning that early on is very, very important. And parents, I would recommend having a conversation, not a one-way, like, Beta, I told you not to do that. You're doing it again. And you're always playing video games. Not a one-way. That's, that, that's a monologue. Have a dialogue. And have a conversation of just saying, look, what are you struggling with? Like, what's Because a lot of times we meet students who are struggling, and they want to get better with managing their time. And they want to get better with like figuring out how to not be so caught up in all this. But they don't know what else to do. Literally, you're being attacked. It's not even your fault. You, we just live in a society where those attacks are constantly coming in, and it's a bombardment. And when you want to do better, you just need someone to guide you. Parents would definitely recommend having that conversation. And students, identify it early on, and don't make excuses. Just say, OK, look, this is something I struggle with. It's OK. I'm going to work on it, inshallah. And find somebody you can talk to. Right? Find an elder, find a mentor, find a friend who you, who you see who really is nailing it, who's doing well with their time. Because the secret behind every good grade is somebody who knew how to manage their time. Every good SAT score is someone who, or someone who cheated a lot. But you know, that's that. we don't want to get into that category. Some secret behind every good college admission, every good extracurricular, somebody who's juggling a lot is just somebody who knows how to manage it. So find a mentor, find someone you can speak with, and actually just have that discussion of, hey man, what are some skills that were useful to you? Right? What, what's helpful? For you, what's actually what are what are different tips that you have for me, right? To curb my Snapchat use or curb my Instagram use. You don't have to go to the to the end of deleting it, right? You could go to that end. I advocate that end a lot, but you can just say, okay, I'm going to just limit it to ten minutes a day at the end of the day, or ten minutes every hour. Because if I'm doing one hour, if I'm doing thirty minutes every hour right now, that type of thing. So that's just the main um, piece to keep in mind. It'll be really beneficial for your college application journey when you actually get to that point. And you won't feel, the last thing anybody wants to feel is you get to the time where you apply to college and you're just like, man, I could have done so much better. Like I really, you, because you'll have let yourself down. Everybody, I'm telling you right now, every student in this room has the potential to not only get into the dream school, but to do amazing things. And you have to believe that. To do really, really well in your life, to accomplish your major goals, to whether it's helping human beings, whether it's making a lot of money, whatever your major goals are, right? Whether it's doing both of those at the same time, whether it's serving your family, serving your community, serving your parents, taking care of the people who brought you up, everybody can do it. It's just a matter now of are you going to start that process and are you motivated enough and can you find that motivation, especially when there's so many different things that are trying to keep us down from that. So with that, inshallah, we'll open it up for, for some more questions and answers and then I think we're going to wrap up, inshallah. Any other questions? folks have. Yes. The difference in preparation for SAT, ACT. SAT is primarily critical reading um, and math. ACT has critical reading, math, and a it's more of a critical science section. It's not really testing your ability to know biology and chemistry, but can you examine 
like read a passage and pull out certain understandings? Can you understand how to how, what a, a a graph is saying, right? So certain analytical skills, um, and then ACT also has a writing component. It's not really much difference in preparation. No, if you if you can just be disciplined, you'll do well on both of them, and just watch things regularly. The biggest thing I'd say for both SAT and ACT is to do something regularly, little bits every day, far better than a summer of cramming or a month of cramming or a weekend of cramming. Just doing little bits every day and getting oriented to that early on. Even if you're like in seventh, eighth grade, you can start learning this stuff. It's not difficult. You go and go on Khan Academy. You can watch free videos and things like that. Yeah, recommendations for books, um, for SAT. I would say get a Kap Kaplan. Kaplan is always good. Very, like you should search Kaplan, SAT, ACT. It's like 20 or $30. And um, you can also get it from the library if, uh, if, if, if someone's not able to purchase it on Amazon. Yeah. Is, question is, is Khan Academy a good source? Yeah, it's an excellent source. I mean, it's, it's you know, all of this has to be supplemented by personal studying and personal work. So you'll watch videos on there and then you have to still do a bunch of stuff on your own, but it's definitely a good source. There's also a lot of stuff available for free out there on the internet, free guides, YouTube videos, etc. Um, but it, the most important thing is pick it and then just go for it. You do it regularly, it's um, very much, it's just practice based. There's not the rocket science on that. There's no really impossibly difficult question on either of these tests. It's just if you practice enough, you're going to do well in shell. If you didn't practice, it's going to be hard, you know? Yeah, question. A person who loses interest really quickly, how can you hold on to something and stick with it? That's a really good question, Sadia. Can I recommend a book to you? I'm reading it right now, it's really good. Easy read. It's called Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. It's really good and it will answer that exact question, is how do you find a goal and stick to it. And what's the difference between just being naturally good at something, like having talent, versus putting in the effort over and over again? It's okay to change your individual goals, right? So the way the goal hierarchy should work is you have one or two big goals. Those are like the big goals that like are your compass for driving your life forward. And then you have some sub goals, right? Or like, okay, how are you actually going to get to that goal? And each sub goal has smaller sub goals, right? Like those are the tactical daily things that you might do, right? To, to, to win, to win the, the full game, right? You can change those small goals. That's okay. You can replace those goals with something else, but you should have one compass that drives you forward day in and day out. And that book helps answer that question. I recommend it for all of the students here. It's an easy read. If you read it now, you will be in a really, really good shape. Um, and Grit, G-R-I-T, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. It's by a woman named Angela Duckworth. Other questions? Yes. What's the best uh, pre-med track? The best pre-med track. Uh, there is no best pre-med track. There's no such thing as the best pre-med track. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can take English and take all your science classes and do well in the MCAT and do, do extracurriculars. You can do biology. You can do chemistry. You can do law. You can do dance. Anything. So you, But because it has nothing to do with the school you go to, it has everything to do with the student you are. This is the this is actually a big a big uh, problem is people think you can go to a school and it'll help you get into another school. It's not like that. You can go to the best private high school and your chances for getting to Harvard are no better than if you went to a low tier school in a low income area that is not highly ranked. It all has to do with how good of a student you are. So if you go to a college that's decent or good and you work really hard, you do well in your MCAT, you're doing extracurricular activities, you're a leader, you're exhibiting, all the, similar to what we mentioned here, same things for apply for graduate schools, just they need to be a little bit more focused, um, and you'll, you'll be able to get in, inshallah. And if you don't do all that, it does not matter what you go or how much money you pay, you won't get in. You There's know, so a few things I would notice in college if you're working on pre-med, because medical school comes after your undergrad, right, in most cases. So would, I would say if the student decides to major in something other than science, making sure that they've taken all the science classes and they have a really strong science GPA. 
that is evaluated separately than your regular GPA. So for example, my sister is a public health major. That is like a common pre-med track, but she didn't want to major in biology or chemistry or whatever. But she's still taking all those advanced bio, chem, physics classes, and she has a science GPA. The second part to keep in mind is research. So if your student can do some kind of research with a professor, that looks great. That's what medical schools are looking for, is having some kind of like research or lab experience. Um, and of course, the general things like extracurriculars and volunteer activities. And then the last thing is having a really strong MCAT score. So studying for the MCAT, which is like, you know, for people who want to go to medical school, the MCAT is essentially the SAT for medical school. Any last questions? Last questions? One more question. Yes, it's true. They look at them, they don't consider them. Yeah, you have a UC GPA that you can get on your transcript as well. So whatever school you go to, they'll have a UC GPA. Uh, but it, they still look at them. Like if you did really poorly freshman year, um, it's okay. But if you did really well, it, it generally will help you. Like if you did really poorly they'll, and you bounce back, it's great. But if you did really well, it also is going to help you out. Cause they, yeah, they're both good situations, yeah. They know it's taking some time to adjust. Yeah. The question is, do they look at unweighted or weighted GPA? Um, uh, without getting into the details, unweighted is basically you, if you make all AP classes and everything equal to just 4.0 instead of 5.0, what's your GPA on that? Uh, they are looking actively at both. The only unweighted is easier to compare schools. If I went to a college that has zero AP classes in, or high school and you went to high school that has 15 AP classes, it's not really fair if you have a 5.0 and I only have a 4.0 because I couldn't even take any AP classes. So then they'll look at my unweighted. If you have you know, a 3.8 unweighted and I have a 4.0 unweighted, it means it speaks to my ability to just constantly get A's. It is important though to, to have good at both situations. If you can take challenging classes, take them. One question in the front and then one question in the back. I would say all types of improvement are looked positively, positively. upon. So if you are working actively to get to a higher GPA and that shows in your transcript, that's a positive thing. There could be yeah. lots of life experiences that might have caused you to have a 2.0 or a 3.0. But as long as you're showing improvement, that's what colleges want to take a look at. The absolute best, if it's not improvement, is just uh, staying high. You know, like always having higher grades is going to be better than lower, but lower and improving is better than higher and decreasing. Yeah. Um, Last and that now back. a comma is going on, so I think we'll stop now. Oh, okay. And then we will, uh, I will if anybody has questions, afterwards please college. feel free to find us after. We'll be hanging out if anybody wants to chat. I mean, we do work with students one-on-one -on -one for college essays and applications. So if you want to chat about that, let us know. Jazakallah khair. Subhanakallah. Allahumma bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha. 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 Nashadu wa la ila